Well, good evening. My name is Mitch Weisberg, and I'm here for EdChat Interactive on this Wednesday after Election Day. You know, disobedient, disruptive, defiant, disturbed. Uh, we've all had students like that. Um, and, you know, to a certain extent, these are just labels that we put on these students. The question is, is can we, are there things that we can do to ensure that every child in our classes has to shine? And tonight's our guest. Our guest is Howie Knopf. Uh, he's this is the third of three three sessions, and in this session, he's going to talk about some things that we all can do to help kids who um, who who may have problems in our class. So uh, this this should be a really really interesting session. Um, and one of the things that makes it interesting, in addition to Howie being so, so fascinating himself, is that we're using this platform called Shindig, which allows you all to interact a lot more than in a typical webinar. So a lot of you, uh, I, I, I saw when you registered, a lot of you have been here before for other sessions. So I'm going to just quickly go through some of the features of, uh, of Shindig and um, EdChat Interactive. Uh, well, you, you know about EdChat Interactive because you, you, a lot of you have been here before, but we're trying to help educators connect with other educators and share practices in a way that's a lot more conducive to adult learning than a typical webinar. We're doing that on the Shindig platform, uh, and there's a number of ways that, that allows you, that you can interact using the Shindig platforms. Uh, one of which is raising your hand, which lets me know that you, uh, you'd like me to call on you and perhaps bring you up to the stage. That's the um, raise hand icon underneath your avatar. Then there's the ask button. So if you have a question for Howie uh, that you want Howie to answer, uh, click on the ask button and it will, um, and I'll pass the question on to, on to Howie. Uh, the third way is through back channels, so you can communicate with other people in your room. If you move your cursor over your avatar, you see that five item menu, and if you click on IM, it opens up a dialog box. And I'd like to encourage you all to do that now. I will not see it, unfortunately, but Howie will, and the other participants in the room will. And maybe you can click on that, uh, open it up, and uh, and type in into the room, you know, what's one thing that, what's a problem that you've encountered in the past that you'd like to be able to handle based on what you're going to be discussing and learning today? So uh, share something that you'd like to get out of today's session on that IM. Again, move your cursor over your avatar, you get a menu, click on IM, it opens up the dialog box and uh, type in something and that'll also help Howie um, a number of you did that when you registered, but that'll also help Howie uh, understand uh, how to target uh, your concerns during his session. And then the the, uh, the final way of interacting on EdChat Interactive is to click on the avatar of another person. Um, again, because so many of you have been on here before, I think I'm going to skip that tonight and go right into Howie. Howie's presentation, but uh, generally what we do is we have you click on the avatar of another person that gets you into a uh, conversation, kind of like a hangout with one or more people, and then you can talk about an issue with that other person. We'll be doing that a couple times tonight, so you get a chance to do that. Uh, we do have uh, ongoing uh, sessions on EdShed Interactive. Uh, tomorrow night, um, I hope uh, a number of you have heard of Anne McMullen. She's actually here tonight attending, uh, attending the session. Uh, she's a real change agent in education, and she's going to be talking about leading, cha leading change in challenging times. Uh, she's written books. She's a featured speaker on FETC, and she should be leading, well, she, I know I've seen the slides, so she's going to be leading a really interesting conversation tomorrow night. And then the following week, we're having uh, Beatriz Arias from the Houston ISD, who um, who has provided? You know, she's um, IT director in, in Houston, and she's worked hard on providing resources, uh, uh, free resources for her teachers. And she's going to be talking about how teachers can find resources and how schools and districts can make resources available to teachers for use in their classrooms. Um, and as with all EdChat Interactives, uh, just go to www.edchatinteractive.org, click on Upcoming Web Events, and you'll be able to register for these. And so, uh, really, without further ado, uh, let me bring Howie up.
Well, well good, good evening. Good evening. And 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 the technical problems have been solved. Oh yes. So you're here. <laughs> you're here. And now that the election is over, everybody can focus on getting back to school again, right? Absolutely. We have a lot of put into play. So um, so let me bring myself down because um, I I know you have a ton of information to to go over with people, and I'll, I'll start your slides. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks, Mitch. And we do have at least two critical laws, as all of you know, that we've got to really focus on in terms of implementation. Uh, but we're going to talk about, in this third of a sequence of presentations, really uh, about social, emotional, and behavioral interventions. So go ahead. Next slide. And next slide. All right, here's the context. Uh, I want to put into the new Elementary and Secondary Education Act, and I'm really wanting to focus on the social, emotional, and behavioral side of it, which includes the school climate. It includes a range of social, emotional, and behavioral interventions in the context of multi-tiered services. Uh, and ultimately, in a preventative sense, it really focuses on helping our kids to learn the, the behaviors and the interactions that will help them be academically engaged in the classroom and get ultimately the academic outcomes that we all want. Next slide. And so in this discussion, what I do want to talk about again is the climate, safety, school discipline side. I want to especially focus tonight on um, kind of a, a bridge between the last session, which really talked about the seven high hit reasons why kids present with challenging behavior. But now we're going to link those to the social, emotional, and behavioral interventions and really focus this at the, if you will, tier two and tier three level so that all of you can go from really doing very effective job with your students up to the next level of excellence. Next slide. And so um, Scully said the best way to predict the future is to create it and that's really what we're all doing right now. We all have an opportunity uh, with the new law to relook at what it is that we're accomplishing, what's working right now in our schools, what's not working, where the gaps are, and how to close the gaps. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about um, certain elements of the new Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which is also called the Every Student, Su Every Student Succeeds Act. Next slide. So relative to social, emotional, and behavioral, one of the critical things, both academically and behaviorally, is that the federal government, basically because of the law, is now allowing or giving the responsibility for a lot of the planning, a lot of the execution, and a lot of the evaluation um, down to the, the school districts through their departments of education. So every state in the country right now is looking at how it wants to implement the law and it has a lot of free reign in that process. Obviously Washington DC is still going to approve the plans but the plans are really coming from a bottom-up perspective. Next slide. So relative to social, emotional, and behavioral, and even in the title I'm, I'm trying to communicate something. You can see I have in lower case RTI, PBIS, and MTS, and that's because when it does appear in the law, uh, the new Elementary and Secondary Education Act, all of these terms appear in the lower case. They never appear in the upper case. They never appear with an acronym. But relative to RTI, uh, ESEA doesn't mention it at all. The words response to intervention, even the words from IDEA 2004, responsiveness to scientific intervention, is not in the law. In the law is um, the term multi uh, MTSS, multi-tiered services and supports, as well as positive behavioral interventions and support. Again, those are in the lower case. So again, in the context of the state departments having free reign to develop their own systems, you don't have to use the federal, if you will, in capital letters, PBIS framework or MTSS framework. Every state can create its own. Next slide. So in the context of multi-tiered services, uh, here is literally the definition out of the law. It is a comprehensive continuum of evidence-based systemic practices to support a rapid response to students' needs with regular observation to facilitate a base instructional decision-making. 
Now, this term only appears five times in the law, and two of them are basically in the definition section, and three of them are focusing on students with disabilities and English language learners. But again, it is in the lower case, and it is a system that is being designed by the states, and especially, obviously, by the districts and schools. Next slide. And so here's one representation. This is actually the representation of the multi-tiered services from the state of Arkansas for the 13 years that I worked with the Arkansas Department of Education and directed their state improvement and state personnel development grant. But we, don't, we didn't use triangles. So you can see you've got tier one, tier two, and tier three. You've got the interdependency between the academic and the behavioral. And then in the core is what we call the sprint process, which some of you call the student assistance team or um, the building intervention team or the child study team, whatever it is. But that problem solving process is in the core. But you've got, as you can see, represented the three tiers of services. But the critical point I want to make in this remake, the potential remake in your state of the tiers, is that the tiers is not about percentages. It's not about uh, whole group, small group, and, and individual. It is about the intensity of services, support, strategies, and programs that kids need academically and behaviorally to be successful. Next slide. Now, relative to positive behavioral support, um, again, it is in the new ESEA, it's in the lower case, but most of the positive behavioral support guidance is really from IDEA 2004, and the Office of Special Ed Programs reminded us of this in a very recent, you can see August 1st of this year, guidance letter, and they reminded everyone across the country. Uh, and this is a quote from the guidance letter, that in the case of a child whose behavior impedes the child's learning or that of theirs, the IEP team must consider, not must do, not as mandated to do, but must consider when necessary to provide free and appropriate public education for the student, include in the IEP the use of positive behavioral interventions and supports and other strategies to address behavior. So today I want to talk about examples of what those positive behavioral interventions and supports could be. Next slide. So a little quote here from Ben Franklin, when everyone's thinking alike, no one is thinking. And so we've got to think. We have an opportunity to think out of the box now in terms of our multi-tiered services, our positive behavioral support system, our cl school discipline, classroom management, and student self-management. We got a chance to rethink what are we going to do for the next number of years that we're implementing this new federal law. Next slide. So let's focus on interventions. From my perspective, and, and I'm bringing right now 35 years of experience at the table. I'm a national consultant. Uh, I work all over the country. I'm right now. I'm in uh, Appalachia, uh, in the western part of Kentucky, where I've been working here for three years on a five-year grant, and we're implementing interventions. So, but the way we do it, interventions need to focus and use a problem-solving consultation intervention mode of operation. It's not a referred test. It's not put the kid into special ed. We've got to figure out what is the problem, why is the problem occurring, what do we need to do, and then implement that as much as possible in the classroom through consultation support. The focus of interventions is on behaviors. We've got to change behaviors, social, emotional, and behavioral uh, interactions. We're not changing labels. Uh, if you've got five attention deficit kids that you're developing behavioral interventions for, you've got five different kids, five different age of onset, five different assortments of behaviors that represent the label. You're not doing an intervention on the label attention deficit. You're doing an intervention on the behaviors, the interactions that represent that label. We've got to follow a response to intervention prevention oriented model. I mean, even, you know, even if it's not in the law, obviously we've got to figure out what the problem is. We've got to figure out why it's occurring. We're doing interventions and we have to evaluate the intervention to see the student's response to the intervention. If it's an appropriate and positive response, then the intervention works. Hopefully we can fade the intervention out. And then a last critical point as much as possible, we want to implement the interventions in the setting where the inappropriate behaviors are 
occurring because as soon as we move the student into another setting, there may be setting specific changes that were actually triggering or sustaining the inappropriate behavior. And now in the new setting, it could be that none of those triggers are present. Next slide. And so here is a representation in its most simplistic form of the problem solving process, a database field assessment process. And again, for those of you who do that big F, big uh, uh, A, you know, functional behavioral assessment, big F, big B, big A, I'm talking about a generic approach. And certainly a big F, big B, and big is part of that approach, but the generic is right in front of you. We've got to identify and define the problem. We've got to figure out why the problem is occurring or why the appropriate behavior is not occurring enough. We've got to link the assessment to strategic or intensive interventions that help to solve the problem and evaluate whether or not it worked. Next slide. So here's another way to do it in a more school-based way. We've got to, when we have a student of concern, we've got to review all of the existing data in history on the student. We've got to identify what we want them to do as opposed to what they are doing so that we identify the gap. We've got to functionally assess and figure out why do we have the gap. So basically, we're using the scientific method, generating hypotheses to explain why the gap is occurring or why we're not getting the appropriate behavior. And then the assessment is to confirm or reject the hypotheses. Next slide. Once we figure out the underlying reasons, then we need to design and write the intervention plan. Now, this is critical because I really believe we've got to design and write the plan before we implement it, because in the plan need to be the resources, the training, and you know all the infrastructure to make the intervention work. We've got to make sure that those are all aligned before we actually do the implementation. Otherwise, we may not do the intervention with intensity or integrity. So obviously, step six, we implement the plan, and then we formatively and summatively uh, evaluate whether or not it's working. Step seven. Next slide. So interventions, again, linked to the functional assessment process, planned before they're executed. They obviously have to be acceptable to the people who are doing the implementation and realistic produce meaningful results. We've got to teach the interventions to the students and many times the teachers and the students before implementation. And this is a critical point. Many times with behavioral interventions, we don't teach the intervention to the student before we do the implementation. One of our catchphrases is you don't do behavioral interventions through discovery learning. So you don't do the intervention where the kid doesn't know what you're doing because the kid may not pick up on what you're doing and therefore you're not communicating the intervention in a, a, a systematic way to the student. So it's going over their head and it's not being strategic in its implementation. Intervention has got to be, again, implemented with integrity and intensity. And ideally, it is useful for other students. Always in our consultation process, we're asking the teacher, are there other students who might benefit from this intervention? Because it's always better when you're doing it more in a group or a whole class level and other kids are getting the benefits, even though the target may be an individual student. Next slide. So from the second session, and again, these are all archived, so you can go back and, and look at these sessions um, um, that, that are on the web page. But what we did in the second session, we identified the seven high hit reasons why kids present with different behavioral issues, social, emotional, and behavioral issues. So the first reason was a skill deficit. The student has not learned or mastered the skill. So if we're wanting the student to, uh, to be able to demonstrate emotional control, or self-control. If they've never learned the skills and strategies of self-control, they would be a high hit one. Reason two, speed of acquisition. They're learning the skill, but not as quickly as other kids. Reason three, uh, it's a transfer of training problem. They're learning it, let's say, I'm a psychologist, folks, so they're learning it and they can do it in my office, but they can't transfer it out to the 24-7 world. Conditions of emotionality, high hit four. What's happening in that situation is the student's able to do it when he or she is calm, but not, for example, when they're upset or angry or anxious or emotional. Reason five is motivation. They can do it. They choose not to do it. 
Reason six is, six is inconsistency. Somewhere in the past, um, maybe a student's been reinforced for inappropriate behavior, and so they're hoping that they can get away with the, the inappropriate behavior again. So there was inconsistency uh, in the previous history, and the student basically has a differential behavioral set. Sometimes they do it, sometimes they don't, but they do it in one setting but not another because one teacher is, is holding them accountable and the other is inconsistently not. And then reason seven, high hit seven, is a special situation which is very complex. So it's where we have problems in multiple settings, where we have the peer group involved, where the peer group may be reinforcing the inappropriate behavior um, almost in diametrically opposed to what the adults are trying to do. And then we have individual kids who are coming from homes of trauma or um, divorce or in, in parents that are incarcerated or they have a disability. And so you've got to factor that more idiosyncratic special situation into um, the behaviors that you're trying to change. Next slide. Now here's the link. So this is the functional assessment to intervention link. And again, we're doing this on a global level, but you know, we'll do what we can do in an hour. So the student has a skill deficit, obviously the intervention is we've got to teach the student the skill. The question is who, when, where, why, how, and under what level of intensity. Speed of acquisition, we're doing interventions to hopefully increase their learning rate. So we may have to modify the instruction. We may have to provide accommodations. Transfer of training, obviously. What we need to do is we've got to train the student for the 24-7. So we have to do generalization training. Conditions of emotionality, we need to teach the student how to prevent from getting in emotional situations, how to control their emotions when they're in those situations so that they can execute the behaviors that are appropriate. Motivation, you're going to see in a couple of minutes, there are any number of different motivational strategies that are well researched. Inconsistency gets more complex, obviously we have to decrease or eliminate the inconsistency, we have to recalibrate the behavior and then hopefully it fade the whole thing out so that the student is in an environment of consistency and responds to that consistency. And then again, special situations are, are, are very complex and idiosyncratic to uh, whether it's a multi-setting situation or uh, a peer issue or something that's more specific to the student. Next slide. And so we have a discussion. Let's have a brief discussion. And let's just talk about what your district and school is doing right now in the multi-tiered area. Because you're going to have to have multi-tiered services, folks. That is a, it is, it is a law. So what are you doing right now? Do you have a student assistance team that meets regularly? And does that team have, and this is my definition of the student assistance team at the building level. It needs to be staffed with the best academic and behavioral assessment and intervention specialists in the school or available to the school from the district. What is your district or school doing right now relative to functional assessment, database problem solving, to fully understand why the behavior problem is occurring before you move to intervention? And then what are we doing at your school and district level in terms of training all staff? We train everyone in the building on the database functional assessment process because it is a building situation that needs to be resourcing all of the people in the building. So the individual classroom teacher, the grade level, building level, multidisciplinary team, your support staff, and so on and so forth. So take a couple of minutes and ponder or discuss um, these three bullets. Which means if you have a uh, microphone and video camera uh, that you should click on the avatar of somebody else who has a microphone and video camera and you can, t you can discuss these, uh, these questions verbally. And if you don't, open up that IM window. Again, move your cursor over your avatar and you get the five item menu, click on IM. Uh, and then uh, type in some of the things that you're doing in your district and discuss some of the things that other people are doing in their districts. And uh, Howie and I will come back up in a couple minutes. Uh, we're also going to ask for some volunteers, uh, and it's fun, uh, to come up here and talk about what you're doing in your district with Howie. So I'm going to bring myself down and we'll give you a couple minutes to discuss this. Howie. So if you're using a tablet and you want to get into the discussion, click on the uh, ask question button and type in your comment or your question into the question. I hope that the answer is no. 
<laughs> uh, no, the the answer is no. As as you were talking, that I was thinking. Well, you know, I could ask, I could do a, a kind of a wise ass response, but really, you're right. The answer is is no. You, I, so I, I, great analogy. I see it. Okay, and yeah. and again, I mean, many times, you know, kind of confirming the hypothesis is always is not always that difficult, but you still have to make sure you've got the data that basically gets to the underlying issues so that you, you know, make the connection with the intervention. So, you okay. know, we got, no, see, we got yeah. Some, yeah, go ahead. We got some questions. No, see, you want to leave me good. some of them? Well, so, so you're seeing the questions in the IM. I don't see the IM, so okay. I can't lose at all. So, so let me, let me deal with them. All right. Great. So I've got a question. Let me sc scan down. And Natalie's asking, what procedures do you use to help improve common order in your classroom? <laughs> uh, and uh, there's a lot of follow-up questions on that. So, I mean, I don't know what grade level it is or whatever. But basically, and, and if you go to the first session that we did, when we talk about classroom management, there, there are basically four elements that we've got to have. Uh, and then the fifth one is an application. Relationships and positive classroom climate. And so the interactions between the kids and the teacher, the kids and the kids, and so on. But I mean, you've got to have a positive, you've got to have the relationships, and you've got to set the tone for the climate in the classroom. You've got to identify the behavioral expectations and teach those expectations. So that's one of the things that keeps things calm, is that the kids, are they know what the expectations are, but they also have been taught the expectations so that they can execute them. The third area is motivation and accountability. And, and again, hopefully with the older kids, they're self-motivated and self-accountable. But I mean, once the kids have demonstrated the appropriate, you know, can demonstrate the appropriate behavior, we want to make sure that they're motivated to do it. So it's not that we're giving stickers to everyone, but we want kids, you know, to, to, to execute what it is that they're able to do. The fourth area, consistency. The fifth is that application. So it, it's not that it's complex to do, but it's a multifaceted process to you know have a calm classroom. Um, it's got to be a classroom that is structured, not overstructured. It's got to be predictable. It's got to be fun. The the instruction has got to be engaging, but it but it's also got to have those other elements as an example. So another question is. Let me scan back up because people were. Oh, that's good. I'm glad. I'm glad people are interacting. Okay. All right. Here's one, and it's um, from Natalie, and she says we have a program with Tier One, Two, and Three. I work for different teams for reading intervention and math. Our school has a behavioral intervention program to address facing uh, students that are having all the problems that we're talking about tonight, and so on. All right. So let me talk about this you know, two different ways. One, the way that seven-step process that Mitch, you know, re-alluded to is designed to work is really at the very beginning of the process when a teacher has done everything they can do for a student and with a student and they're still having a problem. And so we think they're at, right at the very beginning of the process, we've got to start doing the database problem-solving process. What some of my colleagues do with the three-tiered model, which is just, I'm sorry, it's just inappropriate and incorrect is what they do is if the student's not having a lot of success at tier one, they start doing tier two interventions at a group level, but they haven't done the functional assessment yet. So they don't know the underlying reason for the problem. So the tradition in, in PBIS has been, and it's changing a little bit, is that, you know, tier two, you did either check in and check out or check and connect. Well, the question is, what if the student the, the underlying reason for the problem is not going to be um, responsive to check in and check out and check and connect. In other words, what if those, are those two are the wrong interventions? Well, what's going to happen, obviously, is the student's not going to change the behavior. And then sometimes the presumption at that is the student has a more serious problem than we first thought. And now we got to go to tier three. And now we do the functional assessment. And, and again, the medical analogy, OK? Your doctor does functional assessment right at the very beginning. I mean, the doctor doesn't do random intervention, what we call intervention roulette. Because what happens is when you do intervention roulette is usually the house wins. And so we're saying we've got to do the database problem solving process at the beginning of the process, not wait for the kid to fail at tier two and then go into tier three and, 
you know, that just delays the process and if and sometimes it actually makes the student's problem um, more resistant to change or worse. All right, now back to the question at hand. We use one team at the at the d building level, um, database functional assessment, multidisciplinary team, whatever you want to call that team. We use one team. And, and again, I already defined who's on that team. The best academic and behavioral assessment and intervention people. And here's the point. Two questions. When you've got kids who are behaviorally acting out in the classroom, do you have kids who are behaviorally acting out because of academic frustration? Yes, you do. You have some kids who behaviorally acting out, act out because of academics. You also have some kids that have academic problems because they don't have the right behaviors. Mm -hmm. They're not able to sit in the seat. They're not able to uh, work independently. They're not able to work cooperatively in a cooperative learning group. The point is this. In the first step of the problem-solving process, you've got to discriminate symptoms versus the problem. And so if you take the kid who is behaviorally acting out and send him to the behavioral team, all things being equal, all they're going to do are behavioral assessments. You not ask the academic question of, is this student academically frustrated? And that's why the student is behaviorally acting out. And so the that's old problem, why, the old problem of if you only have a hammer, every problem is right. Absolutely. And so that's why you have to integrate the teams. Um, last point, and then I'll move on. Um, back in the old reading first days in the middle 2000s, what did we have? We had all these reading teams. We didn't have math teams. We didn't have written expression teams. We didn't have, and so everyone was focused so much on reading that what happened in this country is that all of a sudden the math scores plummeted. The issue is you need to have an academic team with your behavioral team all working together. Now, again, at the prevention level in our committee structure, and we have a, a, a blueprint on our website, anyone can pull it down, on committees, there is a curriculum and instruction committee that meets at an elementary level at least once a month. One of the things that we do at the secondary level, and it's tough to do, is we've got to have some meetings that are cross-disciplinary. Too many times at the secondary level, the academic departments only meet with themselves. And so you don't get the you don't get the cross fertilization. And the issue is literacy and math. Well, you need to read in science, in social studies, in history, in math. You need to do math in science and social studies. And so the point is, is that sometimes we we create these academic silos, both in the preventative level as well as on the intervention level. So it's, and I'm not blaming anyone, that's sometimes the guidance that you've gotten from your departments of education. And unfortunately, sometimes the guidance just wasn't very wise. It, it, it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, the best way to do it. So, okay. Cool. Okay. I'll bring right, the slides back up, right? Yeah, let's move on. Or do you have on. another question? No, let's move on and I'll add, I'll add in later. Okay, so we're back up on the slides. Let me slide a couple of things out of my way. All right, now I, I've got to do this fast, folks. I can't teach interventions, obviously, in an hour. But what I want to do is I want to give you examples for each of these high-hit areas um, when you're linking the assessment into the intervention. So obviously, high-hit one is a skill deficit. So you've got to figure out what is the skill deficit in, and then your intervention is going to center in and focus in on quote deficit. So, you know, does the student not have appropriate or adequate social skills? And again, you have to drill that down even further. Listening, following directions, asking for help, ignoring distractions. I mean, I wrote one of the top social skill programs on the market, uh, the Stop and Think Social Skills program, and it's got, you know, 60 different social skills. Does the student need attention control training, socialization training, emotional coping, Cognitive or self-control, anger management. All right, so again, the point is, what is the deficit at hand if they've never been taught or they haven't learned the skills to close the gap of the deficit, then that's what our focus of the instruction is. Next slide. Speed of acquisition. Sometimes you've got kids and they can only learn so fast. And, and, and I'm just, I'm sorry about that, folks, but um, you have kids that I call the eight and 10 kids. They, made eight, they make eight months of progress for 10 months in school. 
and you know whether that's a nature or a nurture thing it is what it is and there's nothing you can do to get them to learn faster and what you've got to do is your quote intervention is teach them teach them at the instructional level but sometimes again through modification differentiated instruction smaller group instruction um, through accommodations through remediation um, you are able to speed the some students acquisition so usually the interventions if they're going to speed the students acquisition of learning are going to be in the remediation modification and accommodation areas next slide generalization again um, basically you've got to train for the transfer and so what you've got to do is you've got to do role plays you've got to do simulations you've got to work uh, the the skill that the child has already uh, acquired in the office in multiple situations in multiple settings and in mul you know responding to multiple people in situ in circumstances um, but again a specific intervention that facilitates that is prompting and cueing and stimulus control training next slide conditions of emotionality obviously we've got to teach the kids um, some level of emotional coping cognitive behavioral self-control sometimes anger management or anger replacement um, we're, we're doing this in a case right now we just had a case conference two days ago and it's a student who needs a clinical level um, and again that could be a tier two if you've got the clinician on staff it may be a, a tier three if it's somebody that you have to use community mental health folks but we had a student who needs progressive muscle relaxation therapy. That's a clinical technique that a clinical psychologist, some social workers are trained to do it, some counselors, some school psychologists. Thought stopping, again, is another clinical technique. Um, sometimes in the conditions of emotionality, we have to involve psychiatrists because we've got to do some level of medication to open the window of instruction so that we can teach the student self-control. So there are the interventions or samples of interventions in, in that area. Next slide. There are literally, there are 15, 20, 25 different research-based um, social emotional behavioral interventions focused on motivation. And so I've listed some of them right here. Just positive reinforcement. But the problem with been positive reinforcement is that some staff don't understand that there are different schedules of reinforcement, that you're using different types of um, manipulations in how you do um, the actual reinforcement. Sometimes you do a fixed variable or a, or a you know a fixed ratio or a variable ratio. So I mean, it's it's not that that hard to do, but you've got to know what you're doing because a lot of times what happens is teachers do positive reinforcement, and then they'll come to somebody like me and they'll say, well, the kid the kid won't respond anymore unless we, we give them stronger or or more you know you know better reinforcers. And the whole principle of positive reinforcement is over time you fade it out and you want to get more appropriate behavior for less reinforcement. You want to move from tangible to social to self-reinforcement. All right. Other interventions in this area, group contingencies. There are three different types of group contingencies, uh, interdependent, dependent, and independent. Another set of interventions, differential reinfo reinforcement of low rates of behavior, incompatible, alternative other behavior, extinction planned, ignoring, response cost. Oh, there are 15 to 20 what for me are basic motivational behavioral interventions, but unfortunately our staff are not learning them in their graduate or their undergraduate training. They're not learning them in the professional development as they're in their schools and what happens then is we end up with an intervention gap next next slide inconsistency again is tough um, and, and again I can give you the framework of it but it really gets into the specifics of what is inconsistent is it inconsistent instruction is it inconsistent incentives and consequences it is it inconsistent accountability um, so I've really already spoken to this you've got to eliminate the inconsistency basically stabilize and recalibrate the behavior and then hopefully fade the interventions out so that the student is is self-managing and then next slide 
and we've again already talked about this, um, when we're dealing with high hit seven, uh, it's a very complex situation. And the rule of thumb is when you've got kids in crisis, sometimes you've got to stabilize the crisis in order to be able to then implement the intervention. Sometimes what we do is the kid is in crisis and we're trying interventions and those interventions are simply not going to work because the kid is not open to the intervention because of the crisis and everything that's rolling around him or her. Next slide. And so again, I mean, here's the connection as a summary. Again, I want to emphasize first four areas are sk largely skill-based. You're teaching a social skill, for example. You're teaching the student to learn the social skills more quickly, area two. You're teaching them to utilize the skills in a 24-7 world. You're teaching them to utilize the skills under conditions of emotion. And again, those are all learned skills. So the kids who are problematic in the first four areas are skill deficit kids. Your high hit five is the student who can do it, chooses not to do it. That's a performance deficit student. And then again, you've got the inconsistency in the special situations. Next slide. Here's an example. And for us, these are tier two interventions. And I could have given you, in fact, in the schools and the districts I was working in, in 1990, um, all of these interventions were, were available in 1990. And we just, we've been waiting for, you know, people to use them. But for me, these are tier two interventions. And so, yeah, you've got the check-in and check-out, check-in connect. Those are your relationship and mentoring interventions. But you're only going to use those interventions for the kids who need stronger relationships and mentoring. For the kids who have skill deficits, and you can see the high at one to four, you've got those interventions. For the kids that have motivational interventions, you have those interventions. For the kids that are high hit in six and seven, you have those interventions. And you can see, even with the special situations, sometimes we're doing you know, self-concept um, training or self-concept groups, divorce groups, loss, teasing, post-traumatic stress syndrome. But the point again is you've got to connect the analysis of the underlying reasons for the student's difficulties with the interventions so that you have high probability of success interventions and hopefully we knock it out of the park. Next slide. Again, the difference between the tiers, I, I told you at the beginning I was going to talk about tier two and tier three, and many times there's not any difference in the actual intervention between tier two and tier three. What's different is the intensity how often it's being utilized or taught, um, um, who's doing the instruction. It could be, again, it's a small group or an individual um, implementation. It could be that you're doing at tier two to three multi-setting so that you're getting a consistency of homeschool and community. So again, for us, the tiers are not about percentages of kids or settings of service delivery. They're the intensity of the service delivery itself. And we believe that students need to get the intensity of services, supports, and interventions that they need to change their behavior. And so if a student is in Tier 1 and they have a life crisis and they require Tier 3 services, they go immediately to Tier 3. Do not stop and go. Do not collect 200. You go immediately to the tier three services. You do not prolong the agony. You don't do interventions at tier two to quote qualify a student for tier three. That makes no sense at all. You don't have people waiting outside the emergency room asking you if you've gone to your physician when you've got blood dripping out of a severed artery. I mean, you if you need tier three services, you get tier three services. So, I mean, this whole notion of, of this, this sequencing of thing, it, it just, it was, it was not correct right from the very beginning. We've got a chance to correct it. Next slide. Again, I gave you some, read this, but I gave you some examples on a clinical level of some of the tier three services. And again, some of it is who is doing the delivery of the services and sometimes at what clinical level. Next slide. And so a question, or a couple of questions. How is your school right now doing the database functional assessment, and how does it differ or align with some of the things that I've said so far today? 
Are you connecting the functional assessment? Who is doing the functional assessment? And again, notice it's in lower case. It's database assessment. Now, it could be a big F, big B, big A. I mean, a functional behavioral assessment is a subset of functional assessment. But you've got to make those decisions, OK? So here are some questions. And then where are the gaps in your service delivery system that you need to sit down with some of your folk in the next couple of weeks, in the next couple of months to upgrade the system, close your gaps, go to the next level of excellence? All right, it's yours, Mitch. Good. So either click on the avatar of another person and uh, get into a discussion on what your schools are doing in these areas and uh, give each other feedback. Or uh, into that IM window, uh, type in some ideas that you have or s some of the things that your school is doing. And look over some of the things that other putting in and comment on those too. Uh, let's get a discussion going. Uh, you, some of you, you can see that uh, Howie is there in your room. So you could click on his avatar. And what would be great is that after this discussion break of, of a few minutes, if we could get somebody up on, on stage in front of everybody and talk about things that are going on in their school and discuss them with Howie, because I think that's, that would, would help everybody. So I'm going to pull myself down and please uh, get into discussions. That if if you want to, you can click on that ask button, uh, and that'll be uh, you can use that for a comment or a question that I can uh, pass to Howie or publish for everybody to see. So if you're on a tablet, that's probably your best way of interacting. Academic side of things, one part of the report card is looking at discipline referrals to the office, suspensions and expulsions, disproportionality in regards to that in terms of minority kids being disproportionately referred for uh, office referrals, suspension, expulsion, and students with disability and English language learners. You have to report every year uh, how many kids have been hauled out of school by a police officer or an SRO. Um, I mean, you've, you know, you've got uh, chronic absenteeism that now has to be reported. Um, I mean, you've got a, a number of other indicators on the social emotional behavioral side that now have to be reported. And again, you know, not to make that a, a scare tactic, tactic, but obviously if we're attending to the, the kids in terms of positive climate and social emotional behavioral skill development and good strategic interventions um, that are helping to change these kids' behavior so that they don't have to be suspended and expelled, then, then we all win. Whether it's on the data side or on the student side, that's what we need to do, and that's what obviously we want to do. So it's a great opportunity right now to relook at the system. And again, I'm encouraging people to look beyond what the Department of Education has told you to do, because some of the things that are national quote experts, and these are good colleagues of mine, but there are a number of areas that I totally disagree with, and I've written you know a number of documents that are on my website that I'll send to people uh, to alert them to some of the things, and I've, I've talked about some of them today, some of the processes and some of the decision rules that have been embedded in the, the MTSS system in all caps that need to be rethought. Mm -hmm. And as a teacher, because I think some of the some of the people here are individual, you know, teacher practitioners. Maybe I could go to the school, and I could, you know, well, first of all, it's kind of hard to do all this alone. It it helps to be part of a team. So I could go to the administration, the school, and ask for permission to put together some type of a student assistant team, right? Oh, absolutely. And and again, I mean, in kind of the 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 self evaluation process. Um, you know, virtually every school anymore has a school improvement team or a school leadership team. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, anyone on this call could go to a representative on their school leadership team if they're not themselves on it and say, you know, we really need to um, look at what is in the law that we're going to do anyways. We can't be waiting for the State Department of Education to necessarily give us, you know, guidance or tell us what to do because some well, of this won't. is right. no. Well, and some of this is self determined. So, mm -hmm. you know, some of the points, you know, if I can, Mitch, um, I just want to share some of the comments that people have seen uh, that have put up in the IM. Um, 
let's see, Valia, if I'm pronouncing her name correctly, says many of the schools I see have an inconsistency problem. Absolutely. And that's where, you know, if everybody's trained in the database process, if everybody is using kind of the step-by-step -step protocol, um, that helps to close kind of that inconsistency gap. Rita said, our psychologist does an FBA when the child has not progressed within tier two interventions. It's rare that a student would go straight to tier three, but it has happened. Again, I'm going to strongly recommend that you may have to do that FBA uh, at tier one. And here's my point. Um, we really believe that in general, every time you do an intervention with a student and it doesn't work, you potentially make the student more resistant to the next intervention. And you may actually make the problem worse. And so we've got to be careful. I mean, we've got to do the assessment that we need to do. I know it takes time, but we've got to do the assessment that we need to do before we start doing the random interventions so that we don't do random intervention, we do strategic intervention. But it's nice to hear from Rita that, you know, even though it is rare, and I agree, um, if a student needs to go right to Tier 3, a student goes to Tier 3. So... Let's see, another comment, our tier two interventions are tied to behaviors, but don't always connect to the underlying reason. Again, I think I've, I've spoken to that. Um, absolutely, we are trying to meet the needs of the whole child uh, in this process, no question. All right, let me do the last couple of slides, and sure. then um, we can either have another brief discussion area, or we'll probably be about done with our hour. But I wanted in the last couple of slides to just drill one more step down. And here's the step. So I wanted to give you, you know, and again, some of these were already embedded in things that I've talked about, but differentiate right now some of the core strategies that that we teach. I mean, this is this is one of the things that I do. I work with schools all over the country, usually in long-term relationships. And so we build the preventative system. We do the teaching of the functional assessment, the database problem solving within the student assistance team. And then we train a small number of people um, in these kind of core interventions. But just to give you, again, some of the core interventions. These are interventions to increase behavior, obviously teaching and modeling. But you can see the teaching and the modeling can be directed to a student who has a high hit one, three, or four problem, if you will. Redirection, prompting, and cueing. Positive reinforcement, obviously, is going to be a high hit five, uh, a performance deficit student. The group contingencies are reinforcement approaches. Obviously, self-control, self-management strategies, relaxation. But we embed some of the relaxation, if you will, training into our social skill process. So in our stop and think program, we're teaching kids to stop and think, make a good choice, take a deep breath. And so we are teaching them the emotional, cognitive, and behavioral skills to be able to learn and demonstrate self-control. And again, the point is, is that some kids know what to do, but they don't have the emotional control. When kids are out of control, they're not thinking clearly, they can't execute their scripts. All right, next slide. Some of the core strategies to decrease inappropriate behavior. You've got your differential reinforcement of other incompatible low rates of behavior. Planned ignoring it, or what's also called extinction. Restitutional positive practice over correction. Response cost is also a specialization uh, kind of tactic embedded in that called bonus response cost and timeout. We usually teach, especially at the elementary level, we teach the timeout process to all the teachers in the school because most teachers, most parents, have been taught timeout in a in scientifically inappropriate way. And just to be a little provocative, here's Here's how I know that they've been taught or they have simply uh, learned time out through kind of um, the generational uh, oral history of time out from generation to generation. When I ask teachers or parents how many minutes a child who is eight years old should be in the time out chair, if they say eight, and then they tell me it's the number of minutes per age, I know that they've been trained either improperly or they simply are following the oral history of time out. The answer to the question is, regardless of age, a student goes to timeout only for two to three minutes, and then embedded into um, the end of the process is a mantra that we use, if you consequate, you must educate. So for any motivational strategy, if the student makes a bad choice and they get a consequence, 
the accountability part of the intervention is they have to positively practice the appropriate behavior that they didn't do that they should have done that got them the consequence at least three times. And so the student on exiting the timeout, they positively practice the appropriate behavior they should have done in the timeout chair first practice. Second practice is when they hit their homeroom chair. And the th third practice is within the next three to five minutes. But again, what happens is people are doing interventions and they only have what they've heard the intervention should be rather than the scientific underlying principles and, and, and processes of the actual intervention uh, that is being implemented with integrity. Next slide. And so the question if you were doing this today or if you want to do this later on tonight or tomorrow with your students who are your most challenging kids what specifically are the concerns and again we have to differentiate the symptom versus the true problem and again that may cycle through uh, as you're going through the problem solving process you've got to identify what you want the student to do so the issue is when you've got an inappropriate behavior the goal is not to decrease and eliminate the inappropriate behavior. It's to do that plus replace the inappropriate behavior with an appropriate what's called a replacement behavior, the desired or the expected behavior. Next slide. As you're getting into the functional assessment, what are the underlying reasons for your students' challenges? And again, sometimes what's happening is you may have a number of kids with the same underlying reasons. So yeah, absolutely, you could do some group interventions if you feel that the students are going to be able to pick up the interventions in a small group type of situation. Some kids, you've got to go with the individual. Other kids, you can do the small group. Next slide. And so as much as I can do in an hour, this kind of gave you a sense. I do want you to know, and if you can't find it, email me. On my website, if you go to the uh, products and tools sections of the website, and you can see the website, it's www.projectachieve.net. There are 10 national webinars uh, that I've done over the years. One of them is the seven high hit. Uh, there's another one on uh, the, the behavioral, uh, some of the interventions. But I mean, I'm trying to give people resources. Um, I will also be happy to give any one of you a free with your leadership team or your student assistance team or whatever if people would like a free one hour kind of discussion consultation uh, with me um, I always offer that free to people that come here to EdChat uh, because to me this is about trying to enhance people's skills and get the right place to help the schools to be more successful and therefore help the kids to be more successful so with that Mitch So one of the things that I've learned from all this is that um, I went into here thinking, okay, so you're going to give teachers these things that they can do that's going to allow them to better work with their kids. But it's not just the teacher. You need it's the it's the entire environment, uh, the culture, uh, a team of people um, with with different. Um, different areas of expertise that come together to kind of to figure out what are the things that are causing this behavior, how can we change it, evaluate whether it's changed or not, and they come up with other things. And then the other thing that you brought up today, which I, uh, you, you may have brought up in, in one of the earlier ones, but I'm not sure I, I heard before, is that every time we make an intervention, when it doesn't work, we could in fact be hurting the possibility of any future in intervention helping. And it just that just makes so much sense. It really resonated. Right. Right. We, we need everybody um, in the process. Not ne necessarily that everybody is always at the table together. But I mean, Mitch, you're a classroom teacher. I mean, I'm not a classroom teacher. I need your expertise. And I especially need your expertise because you know more about the student that you're having a concern with than I do. I can look at the mm -hmm. records, I can interview people, and I can get some expertise and, and information from that. But th there are times I need the school nurse. There are times I need the social worker. Mm -hmm. No, it makes a lot of sense. Um, your, uh, your video has stopped. So I'm going to bring you down and, and maybe back up and let's just see. If if you can come back, otherwise we're basically oops. So I guess you're. Um, 
Okay, so I'm going to stop that. So I guess um, your connection must have died, uh, but it was good timing because it looks like we're, we're pretty much at the top of the hour now. Um, I hope to see as many of you as tomorrow night with Anne McMullen or next week with uh, Beatrice Arneas from Houston or at some of our future events. Uh, this is Mitch Weisberg from EdChat Interactive, and um, good night, everybody, and hope to see you soon. Take care.